From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is A Way to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. Call me a seed nerd and I won't mind because, yes, I'm obsessed with where seed comes from and specifically how critical it is to support organic seed breeders and farmers with our seed shopping dollars. I'm also drawn to the stories of particular seeds, and not just old varieties or heirlooms, but the stories of new varieties, too. Today's guest is an organic seed breeder who likes to trace stories of seed and the seed breeders behind it. And we'll hear from her in a moment, but first this message. Underwriting support from Timber Press, your go-to resource for books and gardening and nature. Whether you're a new gardener, a professional at the top of your field, or a reader interested in the wonders of the natural world, their books are there to help you grow. TimberPress.com. When I was scouting topics for this winter's seed series on the blog and podcast, I came across a trove of podcast interviews with organic seed breeders. It was hosted by today's guest, Rachel Haltengren, who received her master's in plant breeding and genetics from Cornell, where her work focused on bell peppers and winter squash, and on establishing priorities for organic vegetable breeding in the Northeast. She's here to talk about why organic seed matters and tell us some of her favorite seed stories. So welcome, Rachel. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Margaret. I'm really excited for our talk. Yeah, I was glad to discover your work and um, what you were doing. And um, So I want to start by asking you sort of a scene-setting question, because I just said organic a bunch of times already in the first minute. <laughs> and I remember asking longtime organic seed breeder John Navazio this a long time ago, but... Why does breeding under organic conditions, why is it so critical? I mean, why does it matter how a crop of seed was bred and then raised? What's the difference? That's a really good question. So organic breeders are really important, and organic varieties are really important to organic farmers, people who are growing under organic conditions, because those conditions can be very different, are often very different from the conditions that conventional growers are growing under. So organic, organically certified growers, they have a different suite of production strategies that they're using. And so varieties need to be well-tailored to those specific conditions. Right. So organic growers need varieties that can do well with um, not synthetic fertilizers, but with, with managing to grow with compost or other, um, other sources of nutrients. They need varieties that are, are adapted to growing in, um, in areas with disease pressures and insects that other growers can spray to protect the crop against. Right. So you just used the word adapted, and, and that's kind of the key is that seeds alive – it's like any living organism, adaptive. It adapts over generations to how it was raised, where it was raised, you know, and, and so forth. And so we want one that's well-matched to our conditions. And if we're growing organically, especially if we were a farmer, um, you know, on a large scale, we want and we're not going to use chemicals and we don't have these tools in our arsenal of, you know, chemicals and so forth. We want seed that's adapted to our conditions, Yes. Yeah, you, that's a, a good point. So people who are growing under organic conditions want seed that is produced under organic conditions, but not only that, they need seed that has been selected for generations, like you just said, under organic conditions, so that the individuals that are selected are the ones that did the best under organic conditions. Right. So I discovered um, you... Uh, via the podcast archive that I mentioned in the introduction. It was recordings of a show you created and hosted for the Open Source Seed Initiative website. Um, The show was called Free the Seed, and I think you did the series each year, a few of them for a few years. But before you explain the show and what its goal was, maybe first tell us quickly what OSSI is, the Open Source Seed Initiative. Yeah, the Open Source Seed Initiative is a nonprofit that's focused on education and outreach around intellectual property rights in crop plants. And so they have something called the Open Source Pledge, which is, it states that people using a variety that is that has been pledged as open source, they agree that they will not restrict anyone else's use of that seed and that they expect 
that people using that variety for future breeding projects will also not apply for uh, restrictive intellectual property rights on their derivative varieties also. And so they have, they have hundreds of varieties that have been pledged as open source and a number of breeders who are working and pledging those varieties. And it's, it's an organization that their goal, in my understanding of their goal, is to have this conversation around intellectual property rights in plants, get people talking about why, why we allow, as a society, we allow utility patents to be applied for and gained on varieties that are developed by breeders, and whether that's something that we as a society want, whether, um, whether it's really fair and, um, and sustainable right. in the long term for us to have varieties that are being taken out of the commons, being taken out of... Um, being used for the public good. Right, so these utility patents that would therefore restrict the use of those genetics in subsequent breeding projects so that the gene pool essentially of traits that are available is getting smaller and smaller because big companies have, you know, these corporations have sort of bought up, so to speak, and patented all of this, these traits in a way, and, and, and that's... It, it makes the gene pool so much narrower, and that can be dangerous. It may not be sustainable. Well, we think it probably isn't a lot of us. Um, yeah. So, so, so OSSI, you did this um, podcast for, I think, a few years, a series for them um, called Free the Seed. What was the goal of it? And, and you sort of created it and, and hosted it and everything. And, you, and tell, us, tell us about what it did, what it aimed to do. Yeah, so I... I started this, this podcast a, a few years ago, and it, the goal of the podcast is to hear stories about how new varieties have been developed and why they were pledged as open source. Right. So in each episode, I talk with a plant breeder about one specific variety. So I talk with a, a lettuce breeder, Frank Morton, about his variety, Hyper Red Rumple Waved, and how he decided to start breeding this vibrantly red lettuce and hearing all of the twists and turns of its development, I thought would be a really interesting thing to listen to. I listen to a lot of podcasts myself, and I always have time for a good story. Yes. And so I thought it would be great to hear the stories of plant breeders and to share those stories with more people, because I thought that other people might also want to hear those stories. Right. And, and so I was really thrilled to partner with the Open Source Seed Initiative, because they have this, this database of varieties that have been pledged, and I thought it would be great outreach for them to have the stories of open source seed available to, to listeners. And, and so in addition to just telling good stories, the goal of this podcast has been to share with listeners who are interested in where their food comes from how, how varieties are developed and to show that plant breeding can be a really accessible thing for, for somebody who, you know, maybe didn't study genetics in, in college or didn't get a master's in plant breeding, that actually you don't need those things to be a plant breeder. Right. <laughs> you, can, you can jump right in. Yeah. And what I've enjoyed in all of the interviews that I've done is this sense of, I had a need, the plant breeders will tell me, or somebody told me about a need, and I wasn't sure exactly how to do it. And I hadn't done plant breeding before, but I decided to just go for it. Yeah. And, and so many times people say that they discovered things that they weren't looking for, and they had so many learning moments in, in the journey of developing this variety. And so I want people who listen to the podcast to hear that too, that if you have an idea for creating a variety that doesn't exist already, that you would like to see in your garden and on your plate, you can... You can try to make it, yeah. and it's, um, it's an approachable process. Yeah. Now, you don't just get results or a new variety in like a year or two or three, and especially with certain 
crops that have a different life cycle, and we'll talk about that in a second. But, And I'll give links to the past Free the Seed podcast for those who wish to listen in full. But I wanted to you know, touch on a few highlights now. You just were mentioning um, you, know, you don't have to be professional seed breeders, and in fact you did a, a segment with um, uh, the Dwarf Tomato Project, and I've uh, interviewed Craig LaHulier on the show as well, um, about this all volunteer worldwide tomato breeding project <laughs> which is pretty wild that they has made dwarf tomato plants their specialty so what were a couple of your takeaways from that one oh that i i so enjoyed getting to talk with craig and with uh, patrina nesky small who was his collaborator yes. out in australia that was a delightful conversation i personally didn't know about dwarf tomatoes as um, as a growth type in tomatoes before i I did this interview, so I learned a lot about tomato breeding, um, and some takeaways from that were, like you just said, the fact that this was an all-volunteer project, so they had hundreds of people who worked with them in Australia and in, in the United States, developing, now they have over 100 different dwarf tomato types, and so dwarf tomatoes... Um, your listeners are probably familiar with determinate tomatoes versus indeterminate tomatoes. Yes. And dwarf tomatoes, um, they grow like indeterminates, but they, they grow very slowly. And so they don't need to be pruned, and they take up a lot less space, but they have this rolling harvest uh, like an indeterminate. And it was really, I enjoyed very much hearing from Craig and Petrina their motivation for starting the project, and that was to provide people with more options. Yeah. To provide gardeners with with this class entire class of tomatoes that they thought would be perfect for urban gardeners and other folks who would be able to grow them in spaces that right now it would be pretty tricky to grow tomatoes in. Yeah. And so they had these hundreds of people sending seeds back and forth and and making observations and growing out varieties and they discovered uh all sorts of things. They had um, all of these moments of making a cross and then growing the, the seeds out of that cross and finding things that they weren't expecting at all. <laughs> genetics, so, genetics. <laughs> absolutely. And, yeah. and so, so many people got to have this hands-on experience of learning about the genetics of tomatoes in a way that was, that was meant for, to be really enjoyable and meant to be fun and interactive and a community and that's the kind of plant breeding projects that people can, can take part in. Um, and you don't have to be a formally educated um, professional plant breeder to do it. Yeah. I know um, you mentioned it uh, closer to the start of our conversation. You did an episode with a longtime organic seed breeder that I admire so greatly, Frank Morton of Wild Garden Seed. And and he and I have talked about, I had interviews in the past, and his varieties I always grow in my own garden, and, and he's has a, a specialty in salad and lettuce, and he was a longtime salad grower, he and his wife, for restaurants and so forth, and then he's sort of like looking out at these big blocks of lettuce, particular varieties of lettuce, he started to see variations in the big, big beds, and he thought he had one of those aha moments, you know, and he said, oh, hey, maybe I could save the seeds from that one over there that's really different and kind of cool, and and a plant breeder was born, sort of accidental plant, plant breeder. Frank Morton became a plant breeder <laughs> instead of a restaurant, you know, salad grower. Um, so you did this interview about his hyper-red, rumpled, waved lettuce that you talked about. And um, I think the part I liked best of that one that I listened to was toward the end where he explains how breeders don't just try to make the lettuce, like in this case, redder and rumpled and waved and whatever, or the winter squash sweeter, or whatever the trade is, the tomato juicier. But they also domesticate the crop in ways, by their breeding efforts, that make the seed harvestable and easy for a seed breeder to then reproduce the crop. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about what he found out about lettuce seed. Now, lettuce is an annual, so it makes seeds every year, yes, at the end of its That's life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so Frank told a story about how he... He got this sort of wild, wild variety of lettuce, so one that isn't grown very often for in, in gardeners' um, gardens or in farmers' fields, but that had traits that he really wanted in a new variety of lettuce. And he crossed it to um, to a variety that he had 
and and that that season when it was when the the progeny of that cross was going to seed, he went to harvest it and discovered actually quite a lot of blown away already. <laughs> so <laughs> wild lettuce. Oops. <laughs> um, folks are familiar with dandelion flowers yes. and the way that they go to seed and, and seeing the, the seeds just puff away in the wind or when we blow them out from our, um, when we're holding them. And lettuce, which is related to dandelion, has really similar seeds that have these little um, parachutes on them that will blow away when the wind comes so that the seeds can be dispersed away from the parent plant. And and Frank discovered that all of the seed that he was planning to harvest, that had happened um, because it, it wasn't a domesticated lettuce. It had all of these wild genes in it. And and that trait of the that little parachute staying on connected tightly to the seed is one of the traits that lettuce breeders many generations ago selected against. Right. In order to save the lettuce seed, you need it to to let go of that parachute and let the parachute leave, but the seed stay on the right. on the seed head. And that that same sort of selection happened in all of our domesticated crops in some ways. So with with um, grains, the grain heads would shatter. The wild relatives of yes. a lot of our yes. our grains, like wheat, they will shatter when they're ready to be harvested. And so they'll fall on the ground, and it's, it's very difficult to get grain out of the dirt. So our ancestors selected for seeds that stayed on the plants until they were able to come and pick them up. Right. And, and so there's, there's a suite of what are called domestication traits in our crop plants that were selected for um, by our ancestors to make them plants that would be easier for us to cultivate and harvest. Yes. Well, that was interesting because, you know, we know about, again, breeding for color or taste or something like that or size or whatever, but, you know, there's these other critical traits if you want to be a, a, if you want it to be a, a seed-producing crop that you can then sell the seed of, et cetera, et cetera. So that was sort of this domestication in that manner was very interesting to me. Um, mm-hmm. Similarly, you did, uh, you did an interview with um, about this Dulcinea carrot, um, it's available from Fruition Seed, and it was bred with a team, I think, that included University of Wisconsin-Madison's Erwin Goldwyn, uh, Goldman and Claire Luby. And I think, they, you know, carrot is a biennial, is that right? So you don't get seed the first mm-hmm. year unless you – and they sort of set up, I think, special environments, artificial environments, to sort of shorten the time that it takes to get seed. And lots and lots of them, they started with 140 varieties of carrots that were sort of – you know, the ones that they were observing to maybe use genetics from and make crust from. Wow, a lot of time, <laughs> a lot of work. And then a what... A lot of time. Yeah, what cracked me up was that, so then you want to know what's the good carrot, and, and so you pull them out of the ground, and again, it's a biennial, so you have to wait, you have to replant it to get the seed next year. So tell us about that, because you can't eat the whole thing, because if your best carrot that you want to get the seed from, you can't eat the whole carrot. You can't taste test too much of it, can you? <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> so with carrot being a biennial, the, the life cycle from seed to seed is that you sow the seeds in the ground the first season, and you get the carrot roots like you would pull up and yeah. eat from your garden. And then um, in order to get seed from that carrot, you need to plant the root back into the field in the spring and let it grow for a second season. Right. And that root will put up a flowering stock and then go to seed in the second year. And so what, um, what was really special about this project is that collaboration that you mentioned between Fruition Seeds and the University of Wisconsin Madison that allowed the project to shorten the amount of time that was necessary to get new seeds and to make those selections such that Dulcinea came out much more quickly than it would have if um, those selections had just been made um, in the Northeast, right. where where it would have taken two years to go from seed to seed. Right. And at the University of Wisconsin, they have winter greenhouses, and so the um, the way that they set it up was the seeds would go to fruition seeds out in Naples, New York. They would grow the, the roots out. They would do selections, and they would taste them, 
Um, and to your point, you can't taste the whole root because then you won't have anything to plant. <laughs> so you can taste like a third or half of the root and then leave the top half yes. for planting the next, the next spring or in Wisconsin into this winter greenhouse. And so they would have the second half of its life cycle in the winter greenhouse, whereas in Naples, it would have had to be stored in a cooler at yeah. that time, yeah. not growing yeah. that, that seed head. And I, I really enjoyed that conversation in particular because of that, that public plant breeding, private seed company collaboration. Yes. And that's another thing that I wanted to highlight in this show was the importance of the public of the program. university system, the state yeah. universities. The, uh, that, That's yeah. right. At, yes. At, yes. Um, land-grant universities have people who are professional plant breeders working for the public good. And I really enjoy stories of those plant breeders working closely with other, other breeders at seed companies and other people who are interested in becoming plant breeders right. to help train folks in, in creating new varieties and saving seeds of the varieties that already exist. And the, the role of, I enjoy hearing when those public programs at the universities are really actively doing this, this capacity building yeah. outside of the universities. Because I think that decentralizing our plant breeding and our seed saving is something that's really critical for our resilience for food security generally. Yeah. So in the last couple minutes, just we just have like two, three minutes left, and you're a super expert in bell peppers and certain squash, winter squash, I believe. And I just wonder, because we're all ordering our seeds, all of us regular gardener folks, and um, I'm going to start them before too long. And I wonder if in those two uh, kinds of plants, you know, any may- maybe like tips, wisdoms, experiences. I mean, I've heard everything like years ago people used to bury matchsticks for the phosphorus in the holes with their bell peppers and um <laughs> And and you know, I didn't know that. Yeah, I don't. You know, who knows? It you know, it was, you know, all these conventional okay. wisdoms and folk mm-hmm. ideas and so forth. And you know, oh, so always start your squash on black plastic. I, you know, who knows? Do any any things about either one or both of those crops that you want to share with us in the last two minutes? A little tips. Well, I guess I would just say that both of those crops are really easy to save seed from. And oh. so if anybody is planning <laughs> is planning to grow them in their garden, uh, they could be a great starting point for doing seed saving Uh on your own if that's something that you haven't um, jumped into yet or are looking to expand in. Because both of those crops, we harvest them when the seed is mature. Right. You don't have to wait uh, any longer. You don't have to wonder whether the seed will be mature when you get into it. You can just save the seed from from the fruit that you're already harvesting. And if you are growing more than one variety of that crop, then you could you could do a little bit of work to make sure that that flower only gets pollinated from the variety, from its own variety, by right. putting a bag over the flower of peppers because they're self-pollinated, mm-hmm. or by doing hand pollinations in squash, which I would say I would recommend anyway doing some hand pollinations with squash because there are, as your, your listeners probably know very well, there are two different types of flowers in squash, and so... If you don't have a lot of a lot of plants of the squash in your garden, or you don't have a lot of bees visiting, you might not get a fruit from every female flower. Right. And so in the garden, I know I have to to go out and look for the male flowers when they're open and shedding pollen, and physically move the pollen onto the female flowers so that I get a good fruit set. Yeah. And um, and that's something that I did quite a lot in a large field. I bet you um, did. And I was doing my <laughs> master's, but it's also something that I do now on All a right. much smaller scale. Well, um, Rachel Haltengren, thank you so much for taking the time. And as I said, I'll give with the transcript of the show, I'll give links to the podcast that you did with all these wonderful seed stories with seed breeders. And I appreciate your taking the time. Underwriting support from Timber Press, your go-to resource for books and gardening and nature. Whether you're a new gardener, a professional at the top of your field, or a reader interested in the wonders of the natural world, their books are there to help you grow. TimberPress.com. 
And thanks to all of you for listening to Now Don't Miss an Episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version of the show on Stitcher or iTunes or Spotify. And you can find me anytime at awaytogarden.com or on Facebook as and on Instagram as at Away to Garden. And happy gardening meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of awaytogarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio.